Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. The big story tonight comes from Canada. Their Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is playing with fire. He's clashing with India over the death of a Khalistani terrorist. He recently had a disastrous visit to India. Then trade talks between the two countries were put on hold and now diplomats are being expelled. We'll tell you what has happened in the last 24 hours, the politics, the reactions and the implications. Meanwhile, in India, lawmakers have moved to the new parliament and on the agenda is increasing women's representation in Indian politics. We say it's a step in the right direction and about time. In China, there's news on the missing foreign minister, Ching Gang. Apparently, he's under investigation over an affair. Why has Ukraine sued its neighbours in the middle of a war? And these are countries that have supported Ukraine and welcomed its refugees. In the US, Donald Trump has decided to miss yet another Republican debate. He's going to Detroit instead. In Libya, misery has given way to anger. People have set the mayor's house on fire in flood-hit Derna. And a special report on the sleep industry. It is booming and how. We'll tell you all about it. The headlines first. Azerbaijan launches anti-terror operations in Nagorno-Karabakh. It comes after months of mounting tensions with Armenia. Almost three years ago, Baku went to war with Yerevan over the disputed region. Armenia accuses Azerbaijan of quote-unquote ethnic cleansing. Russia, of all countries, has urged both sides to respect the truce accord. Moscow says Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping will meet next month. The Russian president will travel to Beijing to meet his Chinese counterpart. This will be Putin's first trip abroad since the International Criminal Court's arrest warrant against him. Xi visited Moscow in March this year. The German foreign minister has called the Chinese president a dictator. An angry Beijing summons the German envoy. China says the minister's comments are absurd and a political provocation. In June, US President Joe Biden had also referred to Xi as a dictator. The Indian rupee hits an all-time low against the US dollar. It closed at 83.27 against the dollar on Monday. The previous all-time low was on 7 September. Surging oil prices and a strong US dollar are the major factors behind the falling rupee. Ex-owner Elon Musk says there are no free lunches. The billionaire is mulling charges, charging all ex-users a monthly fee. Musk says it's the only way to counter bots. He made the comment while meeting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ex formerly Twitter, has more than 500 million users. And in Japan, for the first time ever, more than 1 in 10 people are aged 80 or above. Japan has the world's oldest population. It is also one of the also has one of the lowest birth rates. In February, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida warned that Japan was on the brink of a population crisis. We start tonight with Canada. It has blamed India for the death of a terrorist and it has expelled an Indian diplomat. India has responded in kind and the relationship has hit rock bottom. Now both sides are trading charges. It's as dramatic as it is dangerous. Because the Khalistani issue is rearing its ugly head and Canada's Prime Minister is giving it more oxygen. He's conflating terrorism with freedom of expression and that never ends well. Let's recap the events of the last 24 hours for you. It began with Justin Trudeau's statement. He spoke in the Canadian Parliament and he made a very serious accusation. He said India was behind the murder of a Khalistani in Canada. Over the past number of weeks, Canadian security agencies have been actively pursuing credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar. Trudeau said he'd spoken to Prime Minister Modi, which he had during his disastrous G20 visit. They had a brief bilateral where the Canadian leader was pulled up. India is said to have raised the Khalistan issue. In response, Trudeau is said to have brought up this case. He made the same allegations. The Indian side rejected them. Trudeau went home and the first thing he did was blame India for the killing. Then they expelled an Indian diplomat. Since this was brought to our attention, we've been guided by three principles. The first one, we will seek the truth. The second one, we will protect Canadians at all times. And thirdly, 
we will protect Canada's sovereignty. I have conveyed these principles to my Indian counterpart, and I've also told him that we expect India's full collaboration to make sure that we get to the bottom of this. New Delhi was quick to respond. It asked a senior Canadian diplomat to leave. The Ministry of External Affairs also summoned the Canadian High Commissioner. India lodged a strong protest. It termed Trudeau's allegations as absurd. absurd. The Canadian High Commissioner was seen leaving South Bloc in a huff. Speaking, you got to call the External Affairs Minister. Sir, you meet the... Sir. Meanwhile, the Trudeau government has launched a diplomatic offensive. They're reaching out to other Western powers. They've mobilized their foreign minister for this. Her name is Melanie Jolie. She says that she has raised the issue with key Canadian allies. In fact, Justin Trudeau personally spoke to two leaders, U.S. President Joe Biden and U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Also, the G7 foreign ministers are meeting in New York today. This is on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly, and Canada plans to bring this up there as well. Right now, we know we are in an international security crisis. And one of, the, one of the fundamental rules behind the world's stability and security is the protection of each country's sovereignty. And we see this possible breach of sovereignty as completely unacceptable. An international security crisis. With the death of a terrorist, an international security crisis. Canada is yet to provide evidence for the claims they're making. And they're picking up a fight over this man, Hardeep Singh Nijar. He was killed on the 18th of June this year, shot outside a Gurdwara. This happened in Canada, Surrey, a city in British Columbia. Nijar was a prominent Khalistani figure there. He led a separatist organization called the Khalistan Tiger Force, or KTF. India calls the KTF a terrorist organization. This was notified in February this year. Nijar himself was designated a terrorist by the government of India in the year 2020. In fact, here is how India's Ministry of Home Affairs describes this group, the KTF. The group, and I'm quoting, is a militant outfit and it aims to revive terrorism in Punjab and challenges the territorial integrity, unity and national security and sovereignty of India and promotes various acts of terrorism, including targeted killings in Punjab. The Khalistan campaign is a serious threat. The movement has gained momentum in Canada. And what is the Khalistan movement? It's a separatist, violent campaign that calls for a separate state for Sikhs. They wanted to be carved out of the Indian state of Punjab. Nijjar's KTF was deeply engaged in this Khalistan campaign. He was actively involved in the group's activities, operations, networking, training, financing, all of it. He had connections with prominent Khalistanis. Reports say he visited Pakistan in 2013 and 2014. What for? For a meeting with a man called Jagdar Singh Tara. He too is a Khalistani terrorist, Jagdar Singh Tara. In 1995, he assassinated Bayant Singh, the chief minister of Punjab. He was chief minister from 1992 to 1995, killed by a Khalistani. Nijjar was close to another Khalistani terrorist, Gajinder Singh. He is the leader of a group called Dal Khalsa. They were involved in a hijacking, the Indian Airlines Flight 423. Hijacked in 1981, the plane had taken off from New Delhi. The hijackers took it to Pakistan's Lahore. Gajinder Singh is currently in Pakistan, the man behind this hijacking. Listen to what he said about Nijjar's death, and I'm quoting, Hardeep Singh Nijjar was a dedicated Khalistani until the end. He was like a son to me. He met me a few years ago and solidified the bond of love and thoughts. He was a true Khalistani at heart. So you get the idea about the man we are talking about, a terrorist who led a separatist organization, had ties with prominent terrorists, and was actively campaigning to break up India. Canada calls his death an international security crisis, and is going to battle with the world's largest democracy over it. So that's the story. Now, hear the backstory. Why do you think Justin Trudeau said what he did? He could have waited for the investigation to end. He could have given proof. He could have also handled it diplomatically. Instead, he made this statement in Parliament. It's a dramatic move. It's also a political move. Trudeau wanted this issue to blow up. He wanted the attention and the coverage. He wanted this clash with India. The question is why? After all, India is not China or Russia or North Korea. We're not talking about some rogue state or a Western rival. 
We are talking about the world's largest democracy, also a very important Western partner. Why did Justin Trudeau make a spectacle out of this? To answer that, we need to understand Canada's politics. Basically, two things about it. Their last general election was held in the year 2021. Trudeau's party emerged as the biggest party in parliament, but they were short of majority, around 10 seats short. That's when Jagmeet Singh entered the picture. Now, Jagmeet Singh is a self-declared Khalistani. He leads Canada's new Democratic Party. Thanks to Jagmeet's support, Trudeau became prime minister. If he leaves, Trudeau leaves. He will be out of power. Do you see why that's a problem? Justin Trudeau needs the support of a Khalistani leader to stay in power. So is it really surprising that he shields Khalistanis? That's one reason, the poll arithmetic. The second reason is the Sikh vote in Canada. Around 2.1% of Canada's population is Sikh. It is the fastest growing religious group in the country. Today you can see Sikhs in top positions in government, in the corporate sector, even in Canada's armed forces. Not all of them are Khalistanis and this distinction is very, very important to make. Most Canadian Sikhs are well-meaning, rule-abiding people. The problem is, Canada's leaders have got it wrong. They think Sikh equals Khalistan. So what do they do? They ignore the sub or support the Khalistani elements. It's a tactic that, has, that is almost as old as elections. Here in India, we have different terms for it. We call it appeasement politics or vote bank politics. Justin Trudeau is doing the very same thing, supporting terrorists and justifying it as freedom of expression. And don't think Justin Trudeau is the first leader to play this card. His father did the same. That's Pierre Trudeau. He was Canada's prime minister in the 1970s and 80s. That was the peak of the Khalistan movement. In 1982, India wanted to extradite a Khalistani from Canada. This man, Talvinder Parmar, he used to lead a terror group called Babbar Khalsa. India wanted his extradition. But Pierre Trudeau, then Prime Minister of Canada, refused to extradite him. And the decision made no sense. Both India and Canada are Commonwealth countries, so technically extradition should have been easy. Then why did senior Trudeau refuse? Reports say because India was not differential to the Queen of England. I wish I was making this up. You see, India considered the Queen to be the head of the Commonwealth. Canada considered her to be the head of state. And this difference apparently irked Pierre Trudeau. So no extradition of the Khalistani. It would prove to be a costly blunder. In 1985, this same Talvinder Parmar planted bombs on an Air India plane. 329 people were killed. Until 9-11, it was the worst aviation attack. Canada let that happen. Their official investigation has confirmed this. It talked about error, incompetence, and inattention. I'll repeat that. Error, incompetence, and in inattention. These three words summed up Canada's policy in the 1970s and 1980s. Unfortunately, they apply even today. Trudeau's vote bank politics is dangerous. He is putting Canadians at risk. Just think about it. Where are these Khalistanis based? In Canada. Where are they holding their so-called referendums? In Canada. And where have they plotted attacks? Again, in Canada. India has effectively defanged this movement, but in Canada, it is thriving. So who will be hurt if these Khalistanis go on a rampage? If another Talvinder Parmar emerges? Canadians themselves. The truth is, there is nothing called a good separatist or a good extremist. They're all bad and dangerous. If you make such distinctions, you suffer. Just look at Pakistan. They took Canada's strategy to the extreme. They funded and armed anti-India elements. And who is suffering now? The ordinary people of Pakistan. Meanwhile, India is the fifth largest economy in the world. So Justin Trudeau is playing with fire for short-term political gains. He is playing with a force he does not understand. Even his father did not. And in the process, he's putting Canadians at risk. We've already seen attacks on Indian diplomatic missions, on Hindu temples, even businesses run by Indians. How long before they turn their attention to Canadians? Trudeau's father waited to find out. His mistake cost 329 innocent lives. We can only hope it's not repeated. The Canada dampener aside, today was a very important day in India. We often say that the parliament is the temple of India's democracy and today India got a new temple. For the first time, India's lawmakers met in the new parliament building, this one. 
It was inaugurated back in May 2023, but today the proceedings began, not without a farewell to the old house though. The MPs first met in the central hall of the old parliament, the prime minister spoke, so did the Lok Sabha speaker and opposition leaders, and then they walked to the new building. Now this current parliament session had surprised many. It's not a routine session, it was supposed to be a special one. Usually, governments call these special sessions for a specific reason, to pass a certain bill or to discuss something that's very urgent. But this time, the government did not say why. Why was the session called? Hence, there was speculation, and everyone had a theory about what the government would do. Today, the Prime Minister ended all of that. His first speech in the new building revealed the government's plan, the Women's Reservation Bill. Listen to this. और ये बहुत समय से आरक्षण की चर्चा चली थी हर किसी ने कुछ न कुछ प्रयास किया है लेकिन और ये 1996 से इसकी शुरुआत हुई है और अटल जी के समय तो कई बार बिल लाए गए लेकिन नंबर कम पड़ते थे कुछ उग्र विरोध का भी वातावरण रहता था एक महत्वपूर्ण काम करने में काफी असुविधा हुई लेकिन जब नए सदन में आए हैं नया होने का एक अंतराव उमंग भी होता है तो मुझे विश्वास है कि ये जो लंबे अरसे से चर्चा में रहा विषय है अब इसको हमने कानून बना करके हमारे देश की विकास यात्रा में नारी शक्ति की भागीदारी सुनिश्चित करने का The cabinet passed the bill yesterday and today it was introduced in the Lok Sabha. The 128th Constitutional Amendment Bill. What does it do? It will reserve one third of all electoral seats for women in India, in the Lok Sabha, in the state assemblies, and in union territories. Let me explain with numbers. Imagine there is a state with 100 seats. Now, if this bill is passed, one third of these seats will be reserved for women. That's around 33 seats. In these seats, only women candidates can contest, and they can contest in other seats as well. But these 33 are exclusively for women. It will apply to reserved seats as well. You see, Indian legislatures have st seats reserved for backward communities like scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. One third of these will also be reserved for women. Not all women, only women from that community. Now let's get some questions out of the way. Why was this necessary? And if it wasn't obvious, I will tell you why. Politics has a gender problem. In India, women make up only 15% of all Lok Sabha seats. In the Rajya Sabha, that's 14%. Indian states have the same problem. At least 17 states have less than 10% women in their legislatures. How do you correct this? In an ideal world, political parties would do more. They would put up more women candidates. They would cultivate more women leaders. Since that is not happening, India is betting on the next best thing, and that is reservation. In fact, we already do this. In local elections, India reserves one-third of the seats for women, like your Panchayat Raj system or your city corporations. And this quota has empowered women. India has around 3.2 million local representatives. 1.45 million of them are women. 1.45 million local representatives. 86,000 women head their local bodies. They call the shots. In fact, India is actually doing better than most countries, at least at the local level. Around 44% of our local representatives are women. 44%. In France, it's 40%. In the UK, 34%. In Germany, 27%. And in China, 23%. So India's plan has worked. But as you grow, go up the hierarchy, it hasn't. We have 28 states in India. Only one of them has a female chief minister. Only one, one in 28. The goal is to correct this by extending the quota to all elected legislatures. And elected is a key word here because this quota will apply to the Lok Sabha, but not the Rajya Sabha. Similarly, it will apply to state assemblies, but not state legislative councils. And when will this roll out? Not anytime soon. The bill calls for three steps in a particular order. First, census. Second, delimitation. And then, quota. India's last census was held in the year 2011. The one in 2021 was delayed by the Wuhan virus pandemic. So the first step is to do another census. And based on that, 
redraw constituencies. Only then can the women's quota be implemented. And how long will that take? The government has not set a deadline, not that we know of. Some say it's 2026, others say 2029 perhaps. But delays aside, it would be a huge step forward and we say about time. The roots of this proposal date back to the 1970s. The United Nations asked the Indian government for a report then, the 1970s. They wanted to see our progress on gender equality. So the government of India set up a committee and what it found was not encouraging. The committee said that India had failed to ensure gender equality and this triggered a debate. Several states began reserving seats for women. They thought it would solve the problem. In the 1980s, this idea got political backing. In 1987, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi formed a committee on gender equality. This committee had 353 recommendations. One of them was women's quota. In 1992, this proposal was implemented, only partially though. One third of the seats in local bodies were reserved for women. But state assemblies and the parliament were left untouched. In 1996, Prime Minister Devagoda, H.D. Devagoda, went one step ahead. He tabled the whole proposal, one third of seats in all elected bodies. Now, most of the parties agreed to this idea, but some holdouts remained, especially parties representing the OBC community, the other backward classes, OBC. And what was their objection? You see, seats are reserved for the SC and ST community, but not for the OBC. So the fear was that OBC women would lose out, that upper caste women would dominate the quotas. And so the bill was stalled. Since then, every prime minister in India has tried to revive this effort. Atal Bihari Vajpayee tried twice, no luck. On one occasion, MP snatched the bill from the minister's hand. They tore it up. Dr. Manmohan Singh also tried and he had partial luck. In 2010, the women's reservation bill was passed in the Rajya Sabha, but it never reached the Lok Sabha. So will this time be different? Well, women's quota was the BJP's campaign promise, both in 2014 and again in 2019. Plus, they have a brute majority in parliament, so no coalition business. Which means the proposal will now be a reality. It could usher in a new era of Indian democracy. Now to the country that has no place for women in politics, China. The Communist Party has run China for more than 70 years. Their top decision-making body is called the Politburo and it has never had a female member in its history, never ever. It's truly a boys' club. And those boys too are now disappearing one by one. The Defence Minister of China is still missing. We told you about his disappearance last week. There's been no update since. Before him, the Foreign Minister went missing. And we have news about him. Some leaked details that shed light on his case. His name is Ching Gang. He disappeared in the month of June. He was fired in July. China refused to clarify what happened to him. His official status still remains missing. But the Communist Party knows what happened to him. Recently, they were given a briefing and the details of that briefing have leaked. So why was Ching Gang sacked? The official party line is that he had, and I'm quoting, he had lifestyle issues. What does that mean? What are lifestyle issues? Ching Gang had an affair. And that's why he was sacked. And that's what the Communist Party means by lifestyle issues. It's funny and scary. The party does not like to be explicit. Whenever a story like this comes out, they use labels like lifestyle issues to avoid a scandal. So an affair is scandalous, but a disappearance is absolutely okay and routine. Now, despite the best efforts, the story leaked. The best efforts of the Communist Party, the story came out and Chingang could be in serious trouble. Reports say he's facing an investigation, an internal Communist Party probe. A report was prepared about this affair. It was presented to senior officials in Beijing. This happened last month. Then there was a Communist Party meeting. Ministers and provincial leaders attended it, and they too were briefed about the report. The focus is on Ching Gang's tenure in the United States. He served as China's ambassador there. He was sent in the month of July 2021. He spent barely two years in the U.S. But this posting propelled him to the top. Ching Gang was called back in January this year and that's when Xi Jinping appointed him as a foreign minister. But while he was in the U.S., Ching Gang is said to have had an affair and it led to the birth of a child. No names were given, presumably to protect the identities. But it made Chin's position untenable. Chinese officials feared that 
his America-born child could compromise him, and that given this link, he won't be able to represent Chinese interests impartially. So he was removed. But that's not the end of the story. The investigation is still on. The focus is on national security. Did the affair compromise the Chinese diplomat? Were party secrets leaked? That's what the investigators are looking into. And reports say Ching Gang is cooperating with the probe. Not like he has an option. Remember, Xi Jinping is paranoid about national security. In the past, he has warned officials against any affairs. In the year 2012, he famously remarked, and I'm quoting, you people, you either eat and drink yourselves into the grave or die between the sheets. Those were the words of Xi Jinping. He was complaining about China's ruling class. Now his protege is caught in a scandal and the timing could not have been worse. The president is becoming more insecure by the day. There, there is greater scrutiny of Chinese officials, especially those who engage with foreigners. They've been asked to report their dealings. Beijing is especially worried about American spying, and they've tightened the rules to contain leaks. In recent years, high-ranking officials have faced restrictions in China. They're no longer allowed to own large assets abroad or to hold any significant financial interests overseas. Recently, Beijing also expanded this campaign against spies. China's government reached out to its citizens, and they've started courses. They're teaching people how to catch spies. I'm not making this up. I have some examples, in fact. Chinese universities have new rules. Teachers are now required to protect state secrets. They're taking special courses, and attending these classes is mandatory. Even for teachers from veterinary medicine, they must attend these classes too. In Tianjin, the paranoia is even more extreme. Here, teachers at kindergarten level are being taught how to catch spies. Recently, a training was organized in this province. It was to help teachers, quote unquote, understand and use China's espionage law. All of this sounds too bizarre to be true. Also because China has more pressing concerns right now, a stumbling economy, record joblessness, an unstable property market. But President Xi Jinping is busy punishing ministers for having an affair and teaching kindergarten teachers how to catch spies. What's common between Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia? They're all NATO members, they're Ukraine's neighbors, and they're all Eastern European. Now they have something else in common. All three are being sued by Ukraine. That's right, Kiev has filed a lawsuit at the World Trade Organization. They say all these three countries are violating their trade obligations. Now I know you have questions. Why a lawsuit in the middle of a war? And why against allies like Poland and Slovakia. I'll explain why. Ukraine has an export problem. Most of their food grain used to be shipped via the Black Sea. But now that route is no go. Russia has pulled out of the Black Sea grain deal. Cargo ships can be attacked. So what does Ukraine do? Since they cannot ship overseas, they're using overland routes. They're selling more food grain to their neighbors. Just one problem though. The neighbors are not happy about this. Food grains from Ukraine are flooding European markets, so prices are falling. And farmers say they're not getting paid enough for their produce. That's when Hungary, Poland and Slovakia decided to act. They banned food imports from Ukraine. Kiev says it's not fair, so it's taking these countries to court. And I must say it's a bold move. Poland is one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine. They've given more than $3 billion in military aid to Ukraine. They're hosting 1.3 million Ukrainian refugees, plus they want Ukraine to join NATO. Slovakia and Hungary are a bit different, though. The Hungarian prime minister is a close ally of Vladimir Putin. He is a hesitant backer of Kiev. Same with Slovakia. The country is holding elections this month. The front-runner is a pro-Russia candidate. He has promised to end military support to Ukraine if he comes to power. He's also planning to block Ukraine's NATO bid. So things are already bad. And on top of it, Ukraine has filed a lawsuit. Do they have a strong case? Well, Ukraine's argument is largely technical. Hungary, Poland and Slovakia are all members of the European Union. EU rules say that members cannot decide their own trade policy. The European Commission does that for them. So Kiev says any individual ban is illegal. It's up to the World Trade Organization to decide now. But beyond the lawsuit, this will have political implications. Both Poland and Slovakia have elections coming up. They can't afford to alienate farmers. 
So chances are they will push back. Also, the timing is not all that good. The UN General Assembly has convened in New York, the United Nations General Assembly. President Zelensky is attending in person. He is hoping to rally other countries against Russia. And tomorrow is the big day. The Security Council has invited Zelensky to speak. It promises to be an awkward situation. If Zelensky attends in person, he will be at the same table as the Russian foreign minister. And this has never happened since the war broke out. Zelensky has not come, to, come face to face with any Russian official. Will that end tomorrow? Well, this was Zelensky's response. I'm not sure that we will choose the format. I don't know how it will be, really. Yes, but for us, it's very important that all our words, all our messages will be heard by our partners. And uh, if in the United Nations still, it's a pity, but still, there is the place for Russian terrorists, it's the question, not to me, I think it's a question to all the members of the United Nations. There's a larger trend here. Ukraine's allies are not as invested in the war. Take the U.S., for example. They make up almost 50% of Ukraine's total military aid. If the U.S. pulls out, it's game over. So Ukraine's fate could be decided by the U.S. elections, the 2024 election. It's coming up. If Biden wins, the aid will continue. If he doesn't, things will be tough. Donald Trump has accused European countries of not giving enough aid. He also says the U.S. does not have enough ammunition because Ukraine is getting all of it. And these are not positive signals. So Kiev will be hoping for a long-term plan, one that accounts for elections and regime changes in its allied countries. Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin is thinking along these lines. He's asking allies to dig deeper for military aid. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Air defense is saving lives. So I urge this group to continue to dig deep on ground-based air defense for Ukraine and we must continue to push hard to provide Ukraine with the air defense systems and interceptors that it needs. And right now, in the heat of battle, we must also keep pushing to get Ukraine the ammunition that it needs to keep up the fight. This war was always a test of two things, of Russia's military might and a Western unity. If either one fails, the other gets an upper hand. Putin being Putin was betting on both his military might and Western disunity. The first one may have backfired, but his second bet could still prove right. And talking about Donald Trump, he's often called the master of political showmanship. No one loves the spotlight more than the former US president. But Trump has done the unusual again. He's skipping the upcoming Republican presidential debate. This is the second debate he's missing in a row. You may ask why. And we'll tell you why. Donald Trump thinks he doesn't need the debate. He's so far ahead in the polls that an hour of verbal jousting just doesn't serve his cause anymore. Does that mean he will stay away from the cameras? Well, not really. Instead of the debate, Trump will be addressing auto workers in Detroit. This will be at the same time when his Republican rivals battle it out in California. Our next report tells you why Trump is skipping the debate for Detroit. From unleashing a fleet of flying cars to executing drug dealers. Donald Trump wants to do a lot. But if there's one thing he doesn't want to do, it's debate. The former US president is a frontrunner for the Republican Party. Plus, he loves showmanship, so debates should be easy for him. I mean, he already has his support base and he loves the spotlight. But Trump has adopted a different strategy this time. He believes he's so far ahead of his competitors that he no longer needs to debate them. This isn't the first debate Trump's skipping. He missed the first Republican presidential debate too. However, it's a move that's left many people divided. Some think it's a brilliant strategy. Why engage when you're already so far ahead? Others are slamming the move. After all, isn't debating one's opponents a fundamental part of the democratic process? But when has Donald Trump ever cared about public opinion or even democratic processes? Currently, Trump has a 44-point lead over his next opponent. So debates aren't on his mind. In fact, he's already looking past the GOP primaries and focusing on defeating Joe Biden in 2024. Oh, mother. No! 
So while his rivals debate it out in California, Trump will take the stage in Detroit, Michigan. This is a state he lost to Biden in 2020. Auto workers in Detroit are striking against the big three automakers, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler owner Stellantis. One in ten unionized auto workers are on strike. They want these automakers to raise wages. Well, we hope to achieve uh, raises, uh, double-digit raises, uh, not in a four-year, you know, not, we don't want to wait four years to get it. We need it now. We need it now. You know, and that's the way they've been doing us. You know, these bonus checks, we don't need bonus checks. We need cost of living allowance. You know? Livable wage for everybody that works inside these plants. So some of my fellow union brothers that are working next to me making half of what I make, bring them up. U.S. President Joe Biden has vocally supported unions for decades. He's also backed these auto workers. But there's still some anger among the ranks. Many believe Biden hasn't done enough for them. This is a labor dispute that could threaten Biden's re-election chances, and Trump wants to capitalize on that. Which is why he's ditching the debate for Detroit. This is Trump's opportunity to woo the workers and win back the ones he lost to Biden. Plus, the affected workers are based in Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, three key battleground states for 2024. This is where the presidential contest could be decided, and Trump wants to win these states. So, while Trump is giving the debate a miss, it's not like he'll stay away from the cameras. He will address the union workers in Detroit. It will be around the same time of the debate. So his opponents may not even get their moment in the spotlight. As for American politics, Trump's decision to skip the debate is unusual, but it's not unprecedented. It's just another chapter in the unpredictable saga that is Trump's political career. Whether it's a shrewd move or a missed opportunity is something we can't tell. But remember the famous Forrest Gump quote? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. The same could be said about Trump, and so far, it's worked for him. And now let's move to another questionable aspect of Chinese diplomacy, the constant harassment of Taiwan. Beijing says Taiwan is a part of China. It's, been, it's seen as a wayward Chinese province, even though Beijing has never controlled the island. But it keeps wanting reunification. It has even threatened to do so by force, and China applies pressure every day. Trying to get the island to buckle and fall into Beijing's grasp. And I'm not exaggerating when I say every day. Taiwan's defense ministry posts daily updates. These are updates about Chinese incursions, and every single day, there's a new provocation. In recent times, from last year until now, various types of aircraft from the Chinese Communist, not just J-16, have been continuously expanding their activities. In response, our Navy and Air Force are making every effort to counter these developments. But some incursions are still alarming. Starting on Sunday, within 24 hours, China sent more than 100 aircraft towards Taiwan, more than 100, 103 to be specific. It also sent nine ships. Now, anyone would get alarmed seeing a hundred strong swarm of Chinese warplanes. 40 Chinese aircraft, 4-0, 40 aircraft even crossed the Taiwan Strait's median line. So Taiwan raised the issue. It said these incursions have marked a new high. It asked Beijing to quote-unquote immediately cease such destructive and unilateral behavior. Taiwan wants to remain self-governed. It wants China to stay away from its territory, to respect its air defense zone and the median line. But Beijing claims there is no such thing as a median line. And this is problematic. To understand why, you must first understand what is the median line. Taiwan became self-governed in the year 1949. The communists in China wanted to capture the land, but Taiwan had American support. In 1955, the Americans proposed this median line. It runs between Taiwan and mainland China. Over the years, there have been some moments of calm between Beijing and Taipei. And China does not cross this line when the relations with Taiwan are good. But it has never officially accepted this median line. And whenever it suits Beijing, 
this line is violated. This is when it wants to apply pressure and harass the Taiwanese people. China sent out jets again yesterday. 55 aircraft and seven ships moved towards Taiwan on Monday. 27 of these planes crossed the median line. So China plans to continue with its harassment. The question is why? Why is China ramping up tensions now? The answer may once again lie with the Americans. You see, the U.S. keeps supplying weapons to Taiwan. Recently, two American firms made arms sales. And that has not gone down well with Beijing. Lockheed Martin Corporation of the United States was directly involved in the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan on August 24th as a prime contractor. Northrop Grumman has repeatedly participated in the United States sale of weapons to Taiwan. China has decided to impose sanctions on the above two United States military industrial enterprises. We urge the United States to abide by the One China principle and the provisions of the three joint communiques of China and the United States to stop selling weapons to Taiwan, to stop United States-Taiwan military collusion and to stop arming Taiwan, or else it will certainly be met with a resolute and forceful retaliation from the Chinese side. After this announcement was made, the scale of Chinese incursions into Taiwan's territory went up. China promised a resolute and peaceful retaliation. And that's what they're doing. But I ask again, to what end? Will they invade Taiwan next? Or will they continue their harassment? Either way, China is killing the prospect of the peaceful reunification that it claims to pursue. And now let's turn our attention to Libya, where sorrow has given way to rage. Last week brought the worst floods in Libya's modern history. Thousands have died in the city of Derna. Two dams burst here. They swept entire neighborhoods into the sea. The death toll has crossed 11,000 by most counts and will likely continue to rise. 11,000 people dead. The people of Derna now demand accountability. Hundreds took to the streets with tears in their eyes. They asked for justice. The demonstrators accused Libyan authorities of neglect. They're furious at local politicians and the misgovernance in the country. They even burnt down the house of Derna's mayor. But will their anger bring about change? Here's our report. Last week, Libya saw one of its worst disasters in modern history. A powerful storm hit the country, Storm Daniel. The rains it brought led to a bigger disaster. Two dams burst near the city of Derna. These were old dams, creaking and cracking from the weight of the water they held. This was before the storm struck, but when it did, the dams gave way, and the floods swept away an entire chunk of Derna. Almost a quarter of the city is gone, between those dead, those missing, as well as others who lost their homes. Certainly the situation will change completely. The flood took place in the heart of the city, and not on the outskirts. Mm. Thousands were washed away into the Mediterranean. Many were buried beneath the rubble as the water tore down buildings. And the residents of Derna have been trying to rescue people ever since. They've also been burying their loved ones. Now their grief is giving way to anger. The people of Derna want to punish those responsible for this horror, and fingers are being pointed at Libya's politicians. You see, Libya is in a fix politically. It has two governments and no governance, at least in Derna. One Libyan government is based in Tripoli. That's the one the UN recognizes, but it doesn't govern Derna. Libya's other government is based in the country's east, in the city of Tobruk. This government is backed by the Libyan National Army. It's an armed force commanded by Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar, and this force helped bring Derna under Tobruk's control. But amid the sieges and territorial battles, one thing that was missing was actual governance. Some officials in Derna reportedly knew that the nearby dams were in need of repair. But which government would they answer to? Who would hold them to account? The politicians were busy currying favor with one regime or the other. Now the people of Derna have had enough. They are demanding justice. Hundreds gathered around a local mosque yesterday. The demands of people are not heard by MPs and politicians who have unfortunately appointed someone only interested in harming the city. 
so people protested. People are now demanding a radical change whether targeting those from the previous regime or that which followed. The protesters demand a speedy investigation into the disaster. They want legal action taken against people found guilty of negligence. They want a probe into the current city council budget and previous ones as well. But it isn't just legal action that the protesters want. Some have also blamed Derna's mayor for the disaster. His house was set on fire. It seems the people of Derna are going after everyone they think is responsible in whatever manner they deem fit. And the government in Tobruk has finally taken notice. The head of the eastern-based government, Osama Hamada, has reportedly dissolved the Derna city council. He apparently ordered an investigation into it. Talk about too little too late. And is this really about justice or just a way for Libya's politicians to placate the people of Derna before it's business as usual? We spend about a third of our lives asleep. Or we should. Yet in reality, most of us rarely get enough of it. Over the past five decades, our average sleep duration has reduced. The world over, it has decreased from eight and a half to just under seven hours. Reports say 31% of people sleep less than six hours a night. 62% adults do not get enough sleep. Over a third of adults have reported sleeping problems. And this is global data. Tiredness has become the new norm. In fact, many countries have something called a sleep deprivation epidemic, like Japan, which is the most sleep deprived country in the world. Do you know who comes second? India. In sleep deprivation, India comes second after Japan. Now, some nations are awake more than others, but across the world, sleep has become a rare commodity. And restful nights, a luxury item. This is a dream ticket for many companies, pardon the pun. An entire industry has awoken to our quest for better, deeper sleep. They have figured out that sleep sells and how. Reports say, in 2019, the global sleep economy was valued at $432 billion. By next year, it could be worth about $580 billion, all thanks to bright-eyed entrepreneurs who are promising to get us some shut-eye. They offer everything from sleep trackers and robots to sleep suites with AI beds. Here's a report. The business of sleep is buzzing. And why wouldn't it? Most of us rarely get enough sleep. Nearly a third of adults have reported sleeping problems. Over the past five decades, our average sleep duration has reduced. But as we fail to fall asleep, businesses are waking up to this golden opportunity. They've promised to come to our rescue by offering everything from sleep trackers to white noise machines. There's obviously robots too. They soothe people to sleep by using breathing techniques. Only they need to be spooned and cost about $600 each. If this is out of your budget and a little creepy, apps promise to help as well by narrating bedtime stories. But the sleep industry isn't all gadgetry. At the low-tech end, there are pajamas. These are made from a special material which absorbs the body's natural heat, keeping one warm and cozy. Then there are weighted blankets. They mimic the feeling of being hugged. But for those who want a quick fix, there's always drugs. I'm talking about melatonin supplements or sleeping pills. Last year, this market was worth nearly $2 billion. Some methods are new, others are tried and tested. Yet sleep remains elusive. So people are heading off to sleepcations, meaning vacations with the primary goal of sleeping. In the past few years, there's been a boom in sleep tourism. More sleep-focused resorts are popping up. The Hyatt and high-profile hotels are offering sleep suites with sleep-enhancing amenities, like meditation pods and AI mattresses that track your snoring and REM cycles. While all of this may sound funny, in reality, it's quite alarming. It shows that there's a need for such oddities, because people are just unable to fall asleep. Going to sleep isn't always a simple affair. Part of how easily we go to sleep is genetic. But our genes haven't really changed in the past century. So why are we having more trouble sleeping? The bigger reason is our environment. Experts say the more we light up our lives, the less we seem to sleep. When we stare at our screens all day, it's difficult to fall asleep at night. 
Nicotine, caffeine and alcohol also negatively impact sleep. The closer they're consumed to bedtime, the more trouble you'll have sleeping. Depression and anxiety also curb sleep, both of which are on the rise the world over. Since the pandemic, both have risen by 25% globally. And as a society, we're becoming worse at going to sleep. But why should we care? Because sleep is vital. Sleep loss can cause obesity, hypertension, diabetes, anxiety, dementia, and even Alzheimer's. On the other hand, a good night's sleep helps our memory, learning, and mood. It makes us more empathetic and creative. It helps us manage stress. It can make us more competent and capable too. When we sleep better, we become better students, better workers, even better parents and partners. Honestly, sleep is like a magic potion. Now, if only we had a magic potion to sleep better. But science says we don't need one. We don't need savvy tools either. Going back to basics helps people fall asleep, like sticking to a sleep routine, exercising, staying away from electronics and avoiding large meals or caffeine before bedtime. You see, your parents were right after all. I know. All of this is easier said than done. But the first step is to stop treating our brain like a laptop. It doesn't just power down with an off button. It needs time to wind down. So if you find yourself frozen in the middle of the night with your thoughts racing and 3 a.m. hunger pangs, maybe it's time to wake up to the fact that sleep shouldn't be an afterthought. Without sleep, staying awake is just no good. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. India is celebrating the festival of Ganesh Chaturthi. It marks the birth of Lord Ganesh, the Hindu god of wisdom and prosperity. In Japan, wrestlers traded the ring for the train. The narrow aisle did not stop two Japanese wrestlers from fighting on board a super-fast bullet train. And fans go crazy as football superstar Cristiano Ronaldo lands in Tehran. His Saudi club Al Nassar will play against Iran's Persepolis in the Asian Champions League. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, in 1893, women in New Zealand won the right to vote in elections. New Zealand became the first self-governing country to extend the right to vote to all women. We leave you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We've crossed 2 million subscribers on YouTube. This is arguably the fastest growing news platform and we can't thank you enough for fueling this growth. All those of you who join us every day to watch this show and more, thank you. We launched Vantage seven months ago and these have been some very rewarding seven months for us. So from the entire team here, heartfelt gratitude. <laughs>